Another one is closure, and then the other one is RANS. The, uh, a lot of my colleagues, when they say they're doing RANS, they, the, the RANS equation is an exact low order statistical equation associated with an obvious dose equation. So when my friends that do DNS, they tell me they got this great result from DNS, I ask, does it agree with RANS? If it doesn't, something's wrong with your DNS. And what I mean by that is that the RANS equation is an exact unclosed equation. So if they're doing DNS, they ought to be able to calculate every statistical property in that equation, and it ought to balance. If it doesn't, then there's something they need to look at in their DNS. So this is, a RANS equation is something we don't need to apologize for. What we need to do is have a closure for it and see uh, how we can go forward. This RANS equation is probably the most used equation ever. Engineers use it to do a lot of design and stuff, but they're using it with a theory that was introduced 150 years ago, which is the eddy viscosity theory. And so the eddy viscosity theory should be put away. And I have 19 slides, and I'll get going. Uh, maybe you won't agree with me at the end of the slideshow, OK? The other, one, the other uh, thing is the rental stress. Because of its position, uh, well, that's, I, I don't, I'm speaking to the choir now. I don't need to uh, spend a lot of time on in a closure. So let's get going and uh, see what we have. Just a little tutorial, the first nine slides is giving some arguments of how we got to the closure model for a Newtonian fluid in the first place. And then we'll do four or five slides on turbulence. But one of the uh, things I just want to uh, remind the, um, the audience of is that this kin kinematics of continua, so we're not just talking about discrete physics, we're talking about continuums. Uh, and the motion is, uh, uh, is, is a uh, concept that we require a priori that a material element cannot occupy the same place as, as, uh, as another material element at the same time. So we have this inverse uh, uh, hypothesis that the motion of a particle, you, there is an inverse, we really know what it is, but can be mapped back into its original position. So this, is, this leads us to the idea of a Lagrangian velocity field and an Eulerian uh, velocity field. The uh, equivalent of the motions, if you're uh, in a uh, different frame, so we have this definition of what is a, an equivalent uh, motion. And if you, as, as an orthogonal operator, it's arbitrary. We get to pick it. It's only time dependent. But it connects the motion in uh, one frame to another frame. And so the star is just a different frame than the unstarred. And so this is the formal definition of uh, what, what is meant in continuum mechanics by equivalent motions. So uh, the Coriolis theorem, which uh, transfers the motion to the, uh, maps the, uh, 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 beginning with the mapping of the motion into its um, uh, motion in the star frame, this is not an objective uh, relationship between the chi and the chi star because of this uh, uh, factor here. This is the velocity. The velocity is not an objective property of the field. This is the acceleration. The acceleration is not an objective property of the field. And the acceleration is what enters into the equation of motion for linear momentum. So, the, uh, so an objective property of a continuum, we do have a lot of objective properties of the continuum. Uh, an objective scalar field has the same value of the frames, in all frames. So if, if this were an objective scalar, then it's going to be the same number are the same scalar function uh, in both uh, frames. An objective vector is a, is a vector which the, the magnitude does not depend on the frame, but this, its orientation does. The, um, if you have an objective operator, a dyadic valued operator, then this is an objective operator. And the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues of the uh, operator are objective 
scalars, and the eigenvectors are objective vector fields. So not everything you touch is objective, but some things are really inject objective. For example, uh, when we introduce uh, in classical uh, assumption is that the, uh, absolute pressure, the absolute pressure is related to the internal energy per unit mass. This is an objective scalar field because we assume it is, and it works. Uh, this is the Cauchy uh, 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 stress vector is related to the uh, a normal vector of a material element. The normal vector of the material element is uh, kinematically an objective vector field. We assume that the, st the Cauchy stress vector is an objective. That's an assumption. That's not something that somebody gave us. And so as a consequence, you can then prove that the Cauchy stress is an objective operator. And incidentally, it may or may not be symmetric. That's an additional assumption. So the, um, uh, in an un the, so this, what's shown here on uh, slide seven is the unclosed equation of change for linear momentum and mass. So the, if, if you let the omega symbol be the angular velocity of the frame, then you can relate that to a rotational operator of the frame just by using the permutation triadic. So the equation, the, the familiar, this is the, uh, the what uh, is, is a mass balance or a continuity equation. So this equation is not closed. This equation needs to have a constitutive model for the density. So you have to say, because in continuum mechanics, we assume that every space-time point is in thermodynamic equilibrium. And so you have to have a model for the density. It might be that you say that the density is a constant. If you say that the density is a constant, then the divergence of the velocity field must be equal to zero. If you say it's an ideal gas, then you get something else. So this is an unclosed equation, uh, but we have to close it off. And uh, this is the balance, this is the equation of change for uh, the momentum per unit mass, which is called the velocity. So this is the, uh, and this, this equation is written in a frame of reference, relative, so it's relative to a rotating frame of reference. And so you see the Coriolis term show up here. So this transformation allows you to gather the two omega together with the velocity gradient. This is the acceleration due to gravity. This is the Cauchy stress. Notice I put the tra uh, transpose here to emphasize that it's not necessarily symmetric. It, there are fluids that have asymmet anti-symmetric uh, stresses, not just, uh, they're not just uh, symmetric. And then this is the, the effect on the pressure. So the uh, deformations and strains, we have some important, uh, this is the, uh, the velocity uh, gradient. The velocity gradient is related to the velocity gradient in one frame, the star frame, to the unstarred frame. It has this factor here. This is not equal to zero. The velocity gradient of a vector, uh, the velocity field is not an objective property of the motion. It's not an objective property of the motion. However, the symmetric part of the velocity gradient is, and you can pr prove that theoretically. That's not something you assume. That's what that's that's just true. Okay. So the um, so now we can, we can sit here and make a hypothesis on what is a Newtonian fluid, and so we get to play the game. So if we uh, uh, we assume that this Cauchy stress vector was an objective property, so this dyadic valued operator. The, the, the uh, Cauchy stress must be an objective operator. And so uh, if you're going to make a hypothesis uh, that uh, the left-hand side is objective, then the right-hand side has to be objective. And if you look for, around for a kinematic property that's connected with the Cauchy stress, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, this, is the, uh, the, the, this is the pressure that is objective because it's related to the thermodynamics. And then this is the deviatoric part of the stress. And this is the definition of a Newtonian fluid. So a Newtonian fluid uh, is, is, is a mapping of the strain rate, which is objective, into tau. And tau is objective if the, the dilatational viscosity and the viscosity are objective. And you can prove that they are from the second law of thermodynamics. Second law of thermo thermodynamics requires that. So this is the Newtonian model. This is a good equation, and it works, okay? Now, in, in uh, 1897, 
Boussinesse needed a, a model too to close off the Rand's equation. So he said, oh, just like they did in the, in the uh, continuum mechanics going from the molecular scale to the, to the continuum scale, why don't we have this idea of a viscosity? And that's where it came from. But that assumes, that assumes that the fluctuating velocities at the subcontinuum scale are objective, and they are, because the only forces that are acting there are objective forces. But it assumes that the fluctuating velocity at the continuum scale is an objective vector field, and it's not. It's not. But this might have been a good model. So that's, that's, that's how we got into the business of having an eddy viscosity theory and generalizations of that. And so uh, I would have done the same thing, and so would you, in 1897, okay? So this is the Rand's equation, which is exact. So this is a decomposite, this is the Reynolds decomposition into a mean field, and on, this is an ensemble operation on a uh, ensemble of uh, turbulent flows, and this is the fluctuating component. The Rand's equation, is, is an equation for the, it's the lowest moment, it's an equation for the uh, average velocity, and it has this Reynolds momentum flux, which it needs to be closed. It's not a closed equation. If you, if you take this off the table, this is just a Navier-Stokes equation written in a frame of reference, in a non-inertial uh, frame of reference. And the continuity equation remains the same because we're looking at this at constant physical properties. So I have six more minutes. So hydrodynamic fluctuations, this is an exact equation for the hydrodynamic fluctuations, and uh, just organized it in a special way to emphasize that this is a uh, parabolic uh, convective differential operator. Uh, this, is how, this shows how the fluctuating velocity couples with the external fields. One of, one of them is the velocity gradient. This has a symmetric part, part and an anti-symmetric part, and this is the Coriolis term. So this, this property, this vector F prime is defined here. It's the divergence of a fluctuating stress as shown here. This is the, the fluctuating velocity uh, multiplied by itself. So this is a dyad. This is the ensemble average of that dyad. And we introduce a operator called B, which is the normalized uh, uh, normalization of this F prime, uh, F prime dyad. Now, the important thing about B is that we know it must be a non-negative operator. This is a mathematical fact. The normalized rental stress must be a non-negative operator. That's a mathematical fact, okay? When we do modeling in turbulence, this is something we think after we model it, and then we find out computationally that it's not, it's, they call it realizable. So if it doesn't satisfy this property, then the operator is not realizable, all right? So a normalized pre-stress B, you can uh, make a hypothesis, uh, and we, d we did that in our work, but we just assumed that B was a dyadic valued uh, mapping of R into B. So we're shifting the closure question to B, and this is how we close off the equations. We say that B is a function of R, which is our focus for the Rand's equation. Now, just using the Cayley-Hamilton theorem, you can have an irreducible uh, representation of this, and you get two parameters, and these parameters can be functions of the invariance of R, but they have to be in this domain here for it to be realizable. We know that the uh, B is a non-negative operator. We know that R is a non-negative operator. That's a mathematical fact, and so this, this constitutive model here is just a mapping of R into B. And you, uh, if, if alpha and beta is in this domain, then that mapping is true for all turbulent flows. All turbulent flows, whether they're steady or unsteady, whether they're three-dimensional or whatever. It's just a mathematical fact, okay? So the, um, here's eddy, the eddy viscosity. Uh, no, there's a, so, let me, I've got three more minutes, Chairman. Yeah, okay. Yeah, 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 so I've only got, I have to scoot along here. So there's a mapping that we uh, developed called a pre-stress uh, mapping 
where we connected um, uh, the, the this is this is the the uh, def this is the this is a nonlinear equation for R. B is a function of R. A is an operator that came directly from the Navier-Stokes equation. But this shows that the R that's, that the solutions to this equation are going to depend on the Coriolis uh, term. Okay. And that stemmed from the previous equation that I showed you. So here's Boos and Eddy's viscosity theory. The the question uh, why. Why do we make this assumption? And I think uh, it was a logical thing to do at the time. Okay. But uh, what we know is that the real stress is not an objective operator. But he made it. They assumed that it was an objective operator. And that would work. So this 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 was tested uh, not too long ago, in in 2000 or so, uh, by some folks that did DNS simulations in spanwise spanwise. Uh, rotating uh, 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 flows. The, um, I don't have time to give you a lecture on this, but let me show you the results of this calculation. So this is the predictions uh, from the anisotropic. These are the anisotropic energy states for fully developed channel flow with no ring rotations. We've known this since the 1930s, that the energy is not distributed equally among all the components. The Boussinest approximation assumes that the energy is distributed equally for this flow field in all components, no, everywhere in the flow field, all the way up to the wall into the center, the normalized uh, normal components. The, um, the, the theory that I showed you and then talked with you about, well, this, this, is the, um, this is what happens when you rotate it. So when you have a small rotation, uh, then you break the symmetry. So this, this is the energy distribution uh, in the channel with rotations, and of course the rotation will affect that. The prediction from the uh, Boussinest approximation is that it's still, the energy is still distributed equally among all the flows. When you have a hypothesis, you only need one experiment to show that it's wrong, and you don't use that hypothesis anymore. You can never true, uh, prove a hypothesis is correct. You can only prove that it's wrong. And this shows that the Boussinest approximation for this flow field is wrong. So why use it for any other flow field? So for the theory that we've developed at uh, uh, MSU, this is the DNS energy states. And this is the energy states that we predicted a priori. We did not change any parameters to agree with this energy distribution. We've calibrated our model with non-rotating flows, but then when we took it to this data to c compare with the DNS, it doesn't fit the data, but it's, it breaks the symmetry in the energy uh, distribution in qualitatively the same way. So the question is, well, does the audience have any questions? But this was way too fast probably for you to have any questions. But I just want to emphasize that we had this choice that this normalized rental stress had to be closed. And so we selected this, the, the strain rate 150 years ago, and we still use this. So the eddy viscosity closure is objective because we assume that it was, but it's not realizable. And that's a disaster because the computer won't converge if you have a non-realizable behavior because the eigenvalues will become negative of the normalized rental stress. The, 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 the theory that we published and uh, uh, we've developed over the last 20 years at MSU takes a different view, as I've tried to explain, that, there's, uh, that the, the normalized rental stress, uh, this is a nonlinear algebraic equation for the normalized rental, a mapping of the normalized rental stress into itself, but the parameter that you need is a a, a, a characteristic time constant and this uh, uh, operator here that includes the Coriolis force. Point I want to, the message, the, the thought for the day is that this, we call it the U-RAPS closure, because this means universal, realizable, anisotropic pre-stress closure. We, we made up that word. But it's not objective, unlike the uh, boost and approximation. However, it's realizable for every turbulent flow you want to 
compute every turbulent flow, whether it's, whether it's statistically unstationary or whether it's statistically stationary or it's three-dimensional and so forth. That is worth a chance on this type of mapping. The, ma the, the, the analysis, we don't claim that it's unique, but we claim that it will work in a different way than the classical uh, law. So I thank you for your attention. I apologize for going over time. I apologize for sitting down, and I apologize that my ma mouth is dry. But I'd be glad to answer any of your uh, questions that you might have. Oh, the, no, the, the components of a tensor are not, it's the eigenvalues that are, for instance, every th scalar value thermodynamic property is objective because that's the way we do thermodynamics. We assume that all the forces that act at a molecular scale are objective forces, all right? And so whatever we derive from that is going to be objective. I don't, and, I, I don't, and so when I said that, so the definition of a, of, a, of a, an objective scalar, an example of that would be the absolute pressure, the absolute temperature, the specific energy of the uh, internal energy, and so forth that come out of uh, thermodynamics. I, I don't know if I, that was your question, but you, we could stand closer together, and maybe we can, I can answer your question. Yes. in my pocket. Just one second.